Hello, Julian. It's Jeffrey Guterman. And just um, click on request mic. I can give you a request to speak. I'm going to invite you to speak, Julian. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, this is a little bit of American ingenuity. I have to hand it to you for your flexibility here. <clears throat> and Julian is coming on here. Let me make sure of flexibility here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Jeffrey Gooden, and this uh, interview is part of our ongoing series this month on the anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy back on November 22nd, 1960. We to have Julian Zelizer, the professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University, a New York Times bestseller, a CNN political analyst, and the award-winning author of 25 books. Who better to talk about the remembrance of this event? Uh, Julian, are you with us? You got to click on, uh, you click uh, unmute. You got to turn your mic on. Julian, if you can hear me, um, just click unmute at the bottom left of your iPhone. Just turn your mic on. June, are you with us? Can you hear me, sir? Just click mic, click your mute, uh, turn mute off and click your mic. Well, we have Julian on here. Oh, you're a listener again. Ah, he's out. Let's see if he'll come back in. I'll tell you, Kathy. <laughs> This has not gone as expected. Let's see if he comes back. going to try it again here. I'm going to invite you to speak and hope that you can unmute the mic. And this reminds me, I'm adding Julian as a speaker. Uh, can you unmute it, Julian? And I, yes, I hear you. Thank you. And you know, uh, Kennedy, uh, when he spoke at Rice University, said, we choose to go to the moon, be not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And we do the hard things. And this is one of them trying to coordinate with the technology today. So I really sure. appreciate you coming on. Okay, thank you so much. Um, as I said, I did a brief introduction. This is Julian Zelizer. New York Times bestselling author, professor at Princeton University, a CNN political anal uh, analyst. I watch you all the time on CNN. You're an award, award winning author of 25 books, a great historian. Who better to talk to us today about the legacy of JFK? Can you share with us some reflections you have? Uh, first of all, I, on, as far as the impact at the time, that the assassination had? Well, it was, uh, first, thanks for having me. It's nice, it's nice to be with you. Sorry for the difficulty. But 
Uh, it was a traumatic event for the nation. I, I think it's correctly remembered uh, that way. This was an era uh, not only where the trauma of a, a, a presidential assassination was felt, but where the entire nation still had a collective, meaning uh, the media was still pretty centralized, the news was still limited uh, and also centralized. And when something of this magnitude happened, everyone was watching. Uh, so I think at the psychological level, there is a reason for people from that era remembering exactly where they were, remembering how they felt at the moment, and remembering that as a trans. It also has a political effect. Uh, I'd say that's the second important element of what happened. Uh, Kennedy had not finished a lot of what he had started to do. Uh, and there was some space created upon his successor Lyndon Johnson to connect himself to Kennedy and to say that by supporting Johnson, uh, you are supporting what Kennedy was never able to finish. And finally, it introduces in some ways a decade where violence and trauma uh, will be an essential part of the American experience. And he was the first of many leaders who will be tragically assassinated over the course of the decade. Uh, thank you very much. And, you know, you mentioned where we were. People, I was five years old, Julian, uh, five and a half. I'm in kindergarten on, on Friday, November 22nd. We're in a semicircle. The teacher is reading to us a book. And an announcement came out over the intercom. The president has been shot. And that's emblazoned in my memory. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And I, my, my interest in JFK and the assassination has been unfolding ever since. Now, you also mentioned the media just now. You know, if, you, if one goes on YouTube, you can see uh, recordings of both radio and uh, TV of the live coverage of the assassination and the, the days that followed, including the killing of Oswald but by Ruby, um, this was a different experience for the media. I think, w can you speak to that at least briefly, that for the first time the media was uh, involved in a live coverage of, of a major event? Yeah, I mean, today we're, we're very um, familiar with that kind of news coverage where something big happens uh, and the media will then spend a lot of time collectively focused on that issue with television uh, as a centerpiece. And we have to remember that when this happens, television really only uh, comes into American homes over the course of the 1950s. It starts around 1948, but it's not until the mid to late 50s that a majority of households will have this. And also in terms of the news, uh, there was no CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. What we were talking about were Sunday morning news shows. And then every evening there was a half hour news show on the three networks. And what that meant was about 22 minutes of actual news and, and then commercials. So news was pretty contained. Uh, and then there were the newspapers and radio. Uh, and so when this happens, uh, uh, it becomes a, a kind of a, a swarm effect in terms of trying to understand what happened. And then when Ruby assassinates um, Oswald, uh, yes, this is kind of the uh, introduction of a multi-decade period of live coverage um, that we have had ever since. But at the time, no one had seen anything like this. It was kind of to learn about the assassination of the president and then to see his assassin killed. Uh, and so we shouldn't wonder too much uh, why these events are seared into the memories of people like yourself and everyone else from the moment it happened. And, and you mentioned that the, the national news was only 30 minutes at the time, and that was basically it. I don't, I don't believe there was much, if any, local news. And interestingly, I don't know if it was 1962 or, or sometime in 63 before the assassination, that is when CBS increased their news to 30 minutes. Uh, one other thing you mentioned was the unfinished programs of JFK, um, civil rights, 
Uh, he was seeking a tax cut. And it, uh, there were uh, Medicare. Um, and, you know, I find it interesting to see that, that Johnson took over. He was a, a follower of FDR. And uh, what do you have to say about that, that it was, it was the legacy of JFK and his assassination, and Johnson used that. And of course, as we know, Medicare, the voting rights and civil rights, probably a more robust bill than had, had JFK been in office, got through. Yeah, I mean, when, when Kennedy is assassinated in November of 1963, there are a number of domestic initiatives that he finally had gotten going on. Kennedy was actually very slow on, on many issues. Civil rights, he had been reluctant to move forward on, very hesitant, fearful that if he uh, proposed the civil rights bill, he would lose Southern support in his reelection bid, he'd lose Southern support in Congress. And it's in June of 1963, following the violent uh, confrontations that peaceful protesters had with police authorities in, in Birmingham, that finally Kennedy had made a speech on television and pushed uh, or moved uh, civil rights legislation to end legal segregation uh, to the House. So that was going on and it was being deliberated on at the time of his assassination. Kennedy had been much more proactive and aggressive uh, pushing for Medicare, hospitalization insurance for the elderly, but that had encountered a lot of roadblocks on Capitol Hill. Uh, Southern conservatives and most Republicans were against the program. They called it socialized medicine. The American Medical Association was lobbying it against it. Um, and so Johnson takes over and he says right away, let us continue. And his point of saying to the nation, let us continue, was to continue what Kennedy uh, was doing. And I do think it created some uh, political opportunity for Johnson and he supported as vice president and as a Democrat, uh, the same policies. Um, strategically though, I think he saw some goodwill in the nation and obviously it was easier politically to oppose a living President Kennedy than to oppose the um, proposals of a, a president who had been assassinated. In the end, I don't think it was enough to get a lot of what Johnson gets through, and, and there were limits to how much those memories mattered on Capitol Hill politically. Um, but I do think it was certainly part of the strategy, uh, and I, I don't think it was irrelevant. When, when Johnson, one last thing is, when Johnson runs for re-election in 1964, at the Democratic Convention in August, there are huge uh, photographs in the convention hall where uh, Johnson is shown next to photographs of Kennedy. So Johnson never stops forging that connection. And I think he imagines that politically um, it created a certain amount of strength that otherwise he wouldn't have had. You know, I see JFK as a visionary, but I, I'd like to hear your take on this. A visionary, you know, to go to the moon. He, uh, and But I don't see him as a particularly strong, uh, how can I put this, uh, working strongly with Congress. He was rather passive. Um, and this might lead us to how we may reflect now, and this is in contrast to LBJ, who was a, 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 a terrific uh, um, majority leader in the Senate and worked very well with Congress. Um, what is the impact now in terms of uh, the, ref the legacy of JFK? Well, I think that's interesting in that uh, Obviously, when an assassination uh, happens or any kind of other tragedy, but with Kennedy, it was his being assassinated, you don't know what would have happened. And so part of not knowing what would have happened is the public, historians, journalists, you look back and you try to speculate. Uh, and also sometimes you reimagine who a president was. Uh, and so, for example, it's true. The more you study uh, President Kennedy uh, during his short term, 
you realize how reluctant he was to really do anything on civil rights, as we discussed a few minutes ago. He was not someone who was a visionary on race relations. And he was not someone who was very eager to confront the Southern barons of Capitol Hill at that time. And that led to a lot of frustration in the civil rights community. Uh, I think when Martin Luther King complained about white moderates, you know, it's, Kennedy is one of the people he has in mind. Uh, he's talking primarily about preachers, but he's frustrated. And I think in many ways, Kennedy didn't embody idealism as his presidency progressed, but certainly on race relations, he represented that kind of pragmatic, incremental reluctance that was incredibly painful to civil rights activists who were risking their lives and bodies and saying, you know, justice is necessary uh, right now. But because we don't know how it all would have unfolded and because Kennedy finally proposes something, I think the public kind of looks back and imagines he was one of the big advocates uh, of civil rights. We have the same debates with Vietnam. Um, we don't really know what would have happened. And so you have endless debates. Would Kennedy have expanded the war like Johnson or would he have, as some of his writings and memos indicated, pulled back and had the kind of restraint that he demonstrated with the Cuban Missile Crisis? But we don't know. And what the assassination ends up doing is creating this presidency where unlike others, we constantly reinterpret, reimagine what he was up to and where he was going. And we don't know how that story ends. And so that uh, allows more flexibility in some ways for different interpretations of who he actually was during his time in office. Now, uh, I remember you had mentioned, I think it was June, uh, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that it was the evening right after the standoff between Governor George Wallace and the National Guard to allow a black student to enroll. Uh, so he seems, to, and he called for civil rights there. So it, and, and I've heard that RFK tried to talk him out of it, but he was set on doing it, and he had Ted Sorensen draft the speech, and he had it ready uh, for the night. Yeah, I mean, he had been taking, so there's a, a series of kind of, not smaller steps, but more incremental steps that Kennedy had been making within the parameters of the existing law. So when uh, schools are ordered to desegregate, he is reluctantly and, and carefully uh, willing uh, to, you know, send federal authorities in. And there, there's a famous uh, movie um, by Robert Drew, a really good documentary uh, that covered the standoff at the University of Alabama. And you can literally watch this all unfold and, and get a great sense of, of Kennedy. And when he makes the speech, uh, he goes all in in June of 1963 and calls civil rights not just an important piece of legislation, but a moral issue. So he does change. That said, um, he really wasn't very eager to do what the civil rights community wanted most, and that was bold legislation that would outlaw legal segregation. It's only in June uh, that he finally makes that turn. Um, and again, the bill is in play, and it will ultimately be on Johnson to finish it. So we don't really know how it would have gone. Would he have had the skills to overcome the Southern Democrats and their filibuster? Would he have backed away or forced compromises? Or, or would he have remained bold? And, and that's something that I will never have an answer to. You use the word reimagine, and that is so true. Uh, with his assassination, he instantly uh, became a legend, and uh, for many people. And it is interesting to reimagine. I don't want to take us down to a rabbit hole, but I've done a lot of reading on uh, alternate histories. And my basic take is that had this never happened, and it's quite uh, possible that it, it never happened, as, as crazy it is, as it is that it did happen, it, it, it could have not happened. I envision that he would not have been 
uh, the legend that he is thought of today by so many. And instead, he would have perhaps been mired by, uh, by corruption in his administration. In, fact, in particular, Johnson was being... But unfolded, and because Kennedy finally proposes something, I think the public liked his presidency for different... Governor George Wallace, and I'm out of it. And, and carefully uh, willing uh, to, you know, send federal authorities in. And there, there's a famous uh, movie um, by Robert Drew, a really good documentary uh, that covered the standoff at the University of Alabama. And you can literally watch this all unfold and, and get a great sense of, of Kennedy. And when he makes the speech, uh, he goes all in in June of 1963 and calls civil rights not just an important piece of legislation, but a moral issue. So he does change. That said, um, he really wasn't very eager to do what the civil rights community wanted most, and that was bold legislation that would outlaw legal segregation. It's only in June uh, that he finally makes that turn. Um, and again, the bill is in play and it will ultimately be on Johnson to finish it. So we don't really know how it would have gone. Would he have had the skills to overcome the Southern Democrats and their filibuster? Would he have backed away or forced compromises? Or would he have remained bold? And, and that's something that uh, we'll never have an answer to. You use the word reimagine, and that is so true. Uh, with his assassination, he instantly uh, became a legend and uh, for many people. And it is interesting to reimagine. I don't want to take us down to a rabbit hole, but I've done a lot of reading on uh, alternate histories. And my basic take is that had this never happened, and it's quite uh, possible that it, it never happened as, as crazy it is, as it is that it did happen it, it, it could have not happened i envision that he would not have been uh the legend that he is thought of today by so many and instead he would have perhaps been mired by uh by corruption in his administration in fact in particular johnson was being investigated for shady real estate deals uh, at the time he was assassinated and those investigations were dropped. No, that's true. I mean, it's interesting to think of what doesn't happen and it's always, again, hard. Uh, I mean, with Kennedy, uh, because of how his life ends um, it, it, and creates such heartbreak for the nation, uh, I think there are ways in which his reputation is more pristine and esteemed than it might otherwise be. Look, all presidents over time gain a lot of opposition, their problems become more apparent, and it's a natural part of being in the job. It's a tough job, you make a lot of enemies, you make a lot of mistakes, and we just don't know with Kennedy. Uh, and, and so without that, I think the good and the pristine is what we still tend to focus on. Uh, and similarly with Johnson, yes, I mean, Johnson is under all kinds of uh, scandal attacks, uh, and, and they will continue. But I do think the weight of the moment and how he became president um, kind of pushes some of those aside. And then the focus quickly shifts, for a while at least, to the domestic agenda that Johnson wants to push, as opposed to all those uh, other election-related stories that were gaining uh, you know, uh, gaining attention in, in the press. I have one more question for you, and I appreciate you so much taking the time. You know, you're very generous. Uh, I will say, though, uh, for you to say he had a pristine uh, uh, legend, JFK, as a result of the, uh, the assassination, in, in the eyes of many, because there are some who uh, yeah. don't think it's so pristine, um, I'll just accept what you're saying, and, uh, and I think you, you, you're saying it probably would not have been pristine if we follow history of second-term presidents. Um, no, yeah, sorry, absolutely. I mean, uh, and maybe pristine is not the perfect word, 
Um, but certainly I think there is, uh, you know, more celebration than naturally happens after a president finishes either one or two terms. Um, it's just, it's usually pretty brutal uh, how, how we assess presidents. And uh, this is different, obviously. And um, even as we look back, it's really interesting um, as we reinterpret what happened and as we get into the archives. I think a lot of historians, and especially in the last few years, as a bunch of books coming out, have really been uh, assessing some of the elements that Kennedy brought to the table on foreign policy that in today's world seemed so admirable, meaning a kind of deliberative, thoughtful, cautious approach to dealing with overseas crises. Um, there's a new documentary out on the History Channel that has some good material on that. Uh, and I, I think um, those are the kinds of parts of talking and remembering Kennedy that have gained a lot of strength. And, and if he had finished one or two terms, we might have been either talking about Kennedy in Vietnam in the same way we talk about Johnson uh, or you know, Kennedy's failure to achieve domestic legislation as we talk about with so many other presidents or, or other kinds of stories. Final question for you. Uh, I, like I told you, I, I remember the moment I heard it announced in kindergarten on the intercom that the president has been shot. And by the way, that's to me a strange thing to do to make such an announcement uh, for kindergarten children to hear. Um, and my understanding, Julian, of the uh, assassination has been unfolding ever since. And by the way, in the last 20 years, as a result of YouTube and the internet, even more so. I cannot wrap my head around the fact this happened. It becomes more astonishing to me every day. And um, he almost doesn't seem real to me, Kennedy. And um, I'm wondering if you could speak to why the assassination and the legacy of JFK resonates so much for me and for many of us. Gosh, there's so many answers to that question. One is, is certainly any presidential assassination that is successful is going to be that traumatic. We haven't had many examples of this, uh, but we don't have that many presidents and it is the single leader uh, that we know of. We don't know our congressional leaders the same way. So to see them killed, uh, in the middle of their lives, in the middle of their presidency, I think is just naturally something that can't be uh, unremembered and it won't uh, continue to have that kind of power. And as we get older and live through more different political events, in some ways we think more deeply about what happened, how did that happen, and, and what was lost as a result of it happening. Part of it for young and old people who lived through it uh, is what we discussed. There was still a collective in a way we don't have today. So everyone saw the news as it was unfolding. It was uh, an event we not only all lived through, everyone from that period, I was not alive yet, um, but they lived through it at the same time. They saw the same thing. Uh, and it was an event that was kind of shaping everyone equally. Uh, and I think that's incredibly relevant um, to why we remember it. And then obviously, because of the Warren Commission and the kind of ongoing debates about who killed Kennedy and was Oswald the only person and all the arguments I'm sure you've discussed uh, with your other guests, it keeps the issue uh, alive. It, 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 every few years, the question comes up and it's not just the question about uh, his death and, and the assassination, but it's about Kennedy and we remember him over and over again. Now, finally, I'd say one other thing. I think the reason it still means so much is we live in this incredibly turbulent, divisive political era where there's distrust of government. Our leaders don't seem to have that kind of, for many uh, Americans, uh, capacity to inspire. And here was someone who did it. And so I think the loss that we suffered as a result of the assassination gets more profound, more disturbing, and 
something that we think about more deeply in some ways because of the moment we live in today. I want to I want to thank you very much for your flexibility. You're a, you're a good sport uh, in switching here to Twitter or now X spaces uh, when YouTube didn't work. Uh, you're, you're a great historian, Julian. You you provide a great interview, and I'm going to listen to it again because uh, I'm already feeling that a lot of my reflections are crystallizing based on what you've said. And I want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. Thanks so much for having me. You have a great day and everybody else, thank you.